Oh, that's great. I see everybody sort of quieting down. You can tell when somebody gets up here. <clears throat> Forgive my slightly hoarse voice. I did three consecutive tours today, so. Um, it's really my pleasure. My name is Ilana Benson, and I'm the Director of Museum Education for Yeshiva. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> for Yeshiva University Museum, and it's really my uh, such an honor um, and delight to welcome you to tonight's program, Maimonides and Medicine, which is being done in connection with our exhibition, The Golden Path, Maimonides Across Eight Centuries. Um, just a, a personal word, um, I've been with the museum for 20 years, more than 20 years, and I have to say that this exhibition is one of my absolute favorites. Um, I think for for a museum educator, it's been such a delight to take people through the exhibition, and the effect that it has on people is that they only want to learn more. They want to learn more about the Rambam, um, and I think that um, you know that that just makes us feel terrific. And I will say that one topic that they would like to learn more about is Rambam as a physician, and so we are delighted to be able to do that here tonight to have you learn more about. Rambam bomb the physician. So I just have a few words of thanks that I'd like to say. Um, first, we'd like to thank the Sachs Herrenstein Center. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> um, and individually, Rabbi Ari Rockhoff, Rabbi, <laughs> Rabbi Jordan Auerbach, um, and Eliza Abrams Koenig, um, I, we're really very grateful to all of you for all the help that you provided to us in getting this in getting this program together. Um, it, it really you, you really made a big difference for us. We also absolutely must thank someone who is not here tonight, which is the collector whose pieces fill the majority of the gallery, um, Robert Hartman from Chicago. <laughs> and um, our curator, Dr. David Sklar, who put the exhibition together. So really our, our deepest thanks to all of them. And of course our greatest thanks go to our speakers this evening who are gonna be um, carrying out this program for us. Um, it just, I have to say they're more than just speakers, they're, they're individuals who really were um, vested in the program and helped it also helped us in many ways to move the program forward. So let me first thank Dr. Erica Brown. Dr. Erica Brown is the Vice Provost for Values and Leadership at Yeshiva University and the founding director of its Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs Herrenstein Center for Values and Leadership. Erica is the author or co-author of 15 books on leadership, the Hebrew Bible, and spirituality. And her most recent book is Ecclesiastes and the Search for Meaning. Um, Dr. Jeremy Brown is an emergency physician and historian of science who works at the National Institutes of Health. His most recent book, the Eleventh Plague, Jews and Pandemics from the Bible to COVID-19 won the 2024 National Jewish Book Award for Modern Jewish Thought. And, and finally, but certainly not least, Rabbi Dr. Edward Reichman, who is a professor of emergency medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where he also teaches Jewish medical ethics and holds the Rabbi Isaac and Bella Tendler Chair in Jewish Medical Ethics at Yeshiva College. His most recent book, The Anatomy of Jewish Law, a fresh dissection of the relationship between medicine, medical history, and rabbinic literature. So enjoy today's um, program, and I'd like to um, invite Erica, Dr. Erica Brown to um, say a few words. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs wrote his book, The Great Partnership, 
to honor and dignify the relationship between religion and science. I can only imagine how delighted and honored he would be to know that we're holding this lecture um, in uh, this lecture in a center that is named after him. Uh, I'm delighted to run the Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs Herrenstein Center, and I want to honor uh, our professional staff who's here this evening, who helped organize the program, and our wonderful friends at Yeshiva University Museum. That, too, is a great partnership. Um, I, I, Bob Hartman sends regrets. Bob and Debbie are wonderful friends. And uh, I have to say, having toured the collection with Bob Hartman, it was, it was just simply magical for a student of Maimonides to be able to see Maimonides' signature, to see the pages that he wrote, the books that he studied. It was, it was, it was a, a sort of a, 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 a candy store for any academician and any, um, any student student of the Rambam. We're delighted at the Sachs Herrenstein Center to provide offerings like this, online educational programs, uh, literary prizes, uh, leadership development for our undergraduate and graduate programs. But of course, I think one of the most significant things we've done since October 7th is find all kinds of ways to connect to our brothers and sisters in Israel. So I do want to say that uh, sort of stop our ordinary program for a moment uh, on the 130th day, 38th day of the war, to sort of have a moment of silence for all the doctors, nurses, medical professionals who are trying so hard uh, to save those who they can save, and to honor the memory of the hostage and soldiers who are no longer with us, and pray for Fua Shlema in this medical evening for the good health, the sustained health of, um, of all of those in Israel. So if you'll join me in a moment of silence, before we begin tonight's program. Thank you. Um, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Jeremy Brown, will be speaking about poisons in Maimonides' treatises, and uh, I invite him up to the stage right now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Erica Brown. It's really uh, a lot of fun to be here. I think we're in for a terrific night, and uh, I just want to echo the thanks to all those people who were involved in bring, put, bringing this together. It's not an easy thing. Now, many of us, I know, are familiar with the Rambam's halachic works. We have Sefer HaMitzvot, the Book of the Commandments. We have the Perush HaMishnah, the, the commentary on the Mishnah, which he wrote as a very young man. Um, and of course, the famous Yad. Um, just by show of hands, how many people in the room study or know somebody who is studying Daf Yomi, one page of Talmud a day? It's nearly everybody. How many of you know somebody or is studying Rambam Yomi, of which, oh, we do have some, right? That's terrific, Rambam Yomi. Um, how many of you have studied the Rambam's book on poisons? It's not part of, not, not part of Rambam Yomi. Um, you know, we, we're less familiar with some of these works, uh, sometimes for very good reasons, we'll get into that, but the Rambam, as, as we know, wrote a lot about medicine outside of the corpus of his Perush HaMishnah, of, of his halachic works. And tonight I'm going to focus on just one, there are many, but I'm just going to focus on one um, and talk about the surprising influence of the Rambam's book on poisons. Now. Just by way of a background, the Rambam wrote four major medical works, his commentary on Hippocrates' aphorisms. He did also a more general book of medical aphorisms, his compendia on the works of the great second century physician Galen. And the fourth, the one that we're going to talk about today, the book on poisons and the protection against lethal drugs. Now, this is not 
the name of the book that he gave it, but it's the name that um, was associated with it um, uh, after the 13th century uh, when it was used by uh, 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 an Islamic bibliographer. Um, so it became known as the Rambam's book of the Book of Poisons and Protection Against Lethal Drugs. Rambam wrote other medical works. These include the book on coitus, his treatise on the regimen sanitas, on, 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 on good hygiene, treatise on the explanation of the causes of symptoms, and his commentary on the name of, the, of drugs. And we all know, that, of course, that the Rambam was a very skilled physician of his day in high demand, and famously he wrote that he can't get any of his real work done, which is to write all these commentaries and halachic codes, he can't get any of his work done because all the patients are standing by his door from morning to evening, when's he going to get anything done? So he was very, very committed to his role as a physician, but um, as I said, I think some of these, these other works are less well known. Now. What brought about the Rambam to write a book about poisons? Well, it turns out that he was commissioned to do so. He was actually commissioned by the secretary of the Ayyubid Caliph, the famous opponent of the Crusades, Saladin. I'm, I'm sure many of us have heard of the great Islamic uh, leader Saladin at the end of the 12th century. Anyway, Saladin has this secretary or a counselor called Al-Qadi Al-Fadil. Fadil means distinguished in Arabic, so he, this was the honorific given to him. And Al-Qadi Al-Fadil Al, Al had already commissioned works by Egyptian physicians but he wanted the Rambam to write a work about poisons. And, said this secretary, he wanted it to be a sort of a self-help book, a book that anybody who got poisoned, and remember we're talking about Egypt, scorpions are everywhere, there are poisonous snakes, poisonous corn, this is, a, this is poisonous spiders, this is the real deal. Um, and he wanted the interventions and treatments to be easy to self-administer without the intervention of a physician. Now, the original Arabic version of On Poison survives in at least 10 manuscripts. Uh, six are in Arabic characters and four are in the Hebrew alphabet. It survives in at least 16 manuscripts uh, of the two, uh, two, two Hebrew translations of the work. And um, the fame of the book continued in Europe, where we have at least three different Latin translations of the book starting in the 13th century. And this is a very important point. I'm going to come back to this. This will in some ways be the main focus, those Latin translations. Um, as I said, one of those Latin translations we're going, to fo we're going to focus on, it's preserved in at least six anonymous manuscripts. And uh, some people believe that this, this Latin translation is actually the work of Giovanni da, Cup, uh, da Capua, who was a converted Jew who lived as a physician in the papal court around 1300. And this Latin translation of the Rambam's book on poisons, pay attention to this, was used by a French physician called Guy de Choliac, who died in 1368. And he, Guy de Choliac, was the private physician to Pope Clement VI. We'll come back to that. So, this is going to make an appearance. Now, um, the Book of Poisons was also translated, as, as, as all of Rambam's work, by the Tibonides family, uh, and it was um, translated by them into, into Hebrew. All of this, all of this background testifies to the influence of the Book on Poisons in both Jewish and non-Jewish circles. Okay, fair enough. What's in the book? There is actually a, 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 a two English translations. I have the one that came out in the 50s. Um, there is a more recent translation with more copious footnotes published by Brigham Young University, obviously. Um, so yes, go figure. Um, that's rather expensive version. In any event, so the book has two main parts. The first part is on the treatment of bites of vermin and venomous animals. And the second part of the book is concerned with the treatment of a person who has been exposed to poison. 
The introduction, of course, since it was a commission book, the Rambam begins by extensively praising Al-Qadi Al-Fadil, the secretary to Saladin, and he says, my book is gonna be brief, it is a brief book, uh, and we'll deal with the treatment of a poisoned person uh, and the medications that they will, uh, will take. Um, the Rambam only chose simple remedies, and he writes in his book that he will not address the expensive and rare thing called theriac. Now, theriac was a mythical ointment or drink or stone, depends, of various, uh, there were various ingredients that went into this. And by the way, it's, for, it's from that that we get the English word treacle. Treacle descends from that word, but theriac was this sort of antidote to all known poisons. It was, it was this amazing thing that could do everything. But the Rambam says, I'm not gonna write about theriac. I'm gonna keep it simple. Uh, and he opens his book with a treatment of uh, poisonous bites. He says the bitten area should be tied and incised and the poison should be sucked out by a healthy mouth. I think we've all seen movies where that happens. Uh, so um, that's not uh, so um, uh, strange to us. He says you should induce a vomiting by uh, different compounds and uh, Dr. Reichman and myself are emergency physicians in which one of the first line treatments for some poisons is to induce vomiting. So um, again, something that we do to this day. And he says that the wound should be kept open to allow the poison to leave the body and that the person should, uh, the, the victim should be kept awake so that um, the, the, the poison will not spread during the heat that is generated by sleep. We don't share that opinion today. That, but um, in any event, that's what the Rambam says. And then he says, if the patient's condition doesn't improve after about eight hours, he should only then be referred to a physician because it's probably serious. And, um, and then in the following sections, what would the serious physician do? Well, he, it was always a he in those days, he would, um, apply some topical remedies like slaughtered pigeons, ducks, and of course, goat dung um, uh, would be applied to the bite. And then the Rambam deals with remedies uh, to be uh, ingested with milk and vinegar. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the, the poison person should be given wine, which was sort of beneficial for everything. <laughs> so, um, Remarkably, actually, when I wrote my book on influenza, I noted that alcohol was actually prescribed by physicians as a treatment for influenza back in 1917, 1918. So it's not such a, it's only recently that we've sort of given up on that. In any event, um, the, the Rambam speaks about specific animals that were, that were uh, commonly lethal in medieval Egypt. They were scorpions and spiders and bees and snakes, and of course, rabid dogs. Rabies was everywhere, uh, and uh, the, the bite of a rabid dog was very, very feared. The Talmud speaks about various um, ways to, tr to treat it, but um, the Rambam said, listen, the best way to treat a dog bite is not to get bitten. Uh, you should, so, he, so he spends time on uh, how to recognize what we would call today a rabid or a mad dog. He says they walk alone, they stumble, they stay close to the walls. Uh, but he says in any, if there's any, any, uh, ever, uh, any doubt, you should always take the caution of treating the bite of a dog as if it were rabid. So the first part concludes with a list of foods that are beneficial. These are mostly foods that people, I think, just like to have. Bread and soup, eggs, bread, meat, olive oil, butter, fresh milk. It sounds like sort of a, a, a cookbook. So if you take these, says the Rambam, garlic, onions, and as much wine as the patient can tolerate, you will be in good shape. So that's what the Rambam says in his first part, how to treat these bites from the animals that are so common. And in the second part of the, in, uh, in the second part of his treatise, he devotes it to actually um, uh, dealing with poisons that are ingested unknowingly. Right? You know you got bit by a scorpion. You know you were bitten by a snake. But what if you accidentally ingest a poison? Just by show of hands, for how many people is the accidental ingestion of poisons today? a day-by-day -day concern. 
Nobody, right, that's not surprising, right? Maybe if there are toddlers in the house or you have children around or grandchildren visiting, whatever it is, you put the medicines away, but none of us have this fear of poisons that was certainly evident in Egypt in the time of the Rambam and we will see was really one of the, the, one of the main fears in med, early medieval Europe. So the Rambam says that, um, that food that tastes or smells foul should be inspected very carefully since the presence of poisons in food is often, often causes a change in the smell or the taste or the color of the food. And he notes, assassins tend to choose strong tasting food or drinks like wine or naturally bad smelling foods to mask their poisons. So there were assassins out there who were dealing with poisons. So this is a very detailed um, explanation. As I said, the Rambam says that once a person is poisoned, they should be forced to vomit and, um, uh, and take certain oils and milks and, and, and potions to neutralize the effect. And then the last chapter of On Poisons is devoted to various common poisonous substances and how to detect them. And here he speaks about, and this is the English translation, I don't know how accurate this is, but he speaks about being very careful with what is translated as hemlock, mushrooms, truffles, and black nightshade. These, says the Rambam, are very deadly and less detectable. Okay. The Rambam has other important uh, knowledge to share with people. I'll read you a couple of, of, of my favorites. He writes uh, on page 60 of this translation, there is another thing that adds to the physician's confusion. Some married men are betrayed by their wives by means of food so that they fall ill on the following day or after a few days. And what is worse than death, they contract rampant gangrene resulting in the rotting away of their limbs. The woman as the poisoner. It's a trope that goes way, way back. Uh, and it rears its very ugly head later, but uh, the Rambam says he's heard this, and he's also, says the Rambam a little bit later, he says he's heard from other physicians that a woman who is adulterous sometimes mis uh, mixes her menstrual blood uh, with the husband's food in order to kill the husband, uh, or causing the limbs to fall off. So that's, that's something else that the Rambam has on... Um, uh, but on one of the pages, uh, I, I want to share with you, um, what the Rambam writes about drinking poisonous water. And this is critical. So here's the Rambam, poisoned water. He writes the following. Um, he says the best, again, the best way to avoid being poisoned is to take, them from a take food from a reliable person who is above suspicion because the way to harm by poison is open only to those foods which assimilate the poisonous taste and smell. This is sort of an axiom. There's no such thing as a tasteless poison. Uh, and it also changes the, po the, the appearance. Um, he says, with something boiled in clean water, whether beef or fowl or fried, any attempt to add a poison is impossible. Even the slightest tampering with the food changes its taste and appearance, consistency and smell. And then he adds the following. Also, with pure drinking water, such an attempt is impossible. So according to Maimonides, according to the Rambam in his book of, on poisons, it is impossible to poison or to place a poison in drinking water. It will change the look, it will change the taste, the person will immediately know. And, um, and he says, he, he says uh, further, whoever thinks he can prepare a deadly poison with no undue taste and smell about it, neither affecting the color of the dish or its consistency, he says it's impossible. <clears throat> uh, even though, he said, popular belief notwithstanding, it's absolutely impossible to concoct a poison into a substance uh, without affecting the nature of the substance. And it's impossible, he says, to poison water. Which brings us to the Black Death. Now, the Black Death was an outbreak of bubonic plague. It began around 1346. 
It lasted until 1352. It affected us Jews in the most terrible of ways. It's the only disease in the book that I wrote on pandemics, which occupies two chapters, one on actually what happened to the Jews uh, as a result of the plague, uh, bubonic plague, but the second one is what happened as a result of the pogroms that quickly followed the outbreak of the uh, Black Death. And of course, we all know that the Jews were accused of spreading disease by spreading poisons and poisoning the drinking water. And we have many first-hand accounts of, of, um, of Jews who were arrested uh, as, as, as carrying powders and poisons, uh, tortured and then killed. Um, it wasn't only Jews who were accused of this. Sometimes it was lepers, sometimes it was the rich, sometimes it was the poor, uh, but it was, at the end of the day, the Jews were the ones who, 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 who were the target um, by and large. And of course, this raises the obvious question, from where do we get, where did the people at that time get the idea of poisoning? Why was everybody so worried about poisons? And I think we've already touched on one idea, which was it goes all the way back to earlier times when people in Egypt seemed to be so worried by poisons. Um, poisons were um, discussed by Galen in the second century. Poisons, uh, he wrote a book uh, called uh, uh, the, Ant the Antitodes et the Theoretica ad Pisonem, the, the Antidotes and Theriac uh, Against Poison. Uh, poisons were also discussed by Ibn Sana, who is known as Avicenna, and he was a big influence on, on the Rambam. So poisoning is a great concern to the medieval, the Middle Age, uh, in, to the Middle Ages. And the prevailing theories of the time was that the bubonic plague was caused by a misalignment of the planets and slash or dangerous vapors rising up from the marshes. These are known as miasmas. And that theory of miasmas continued all the way until the end of the 18th century. Um, and an imbalance of the four humors. Uh, and so um, this is sort of the natural explanation of plague, which also may be a, um, uh, which also may be um, uh, 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 a divine punishment. You might get the plague as a natural consequence, or you may get the plague as a result of God punishing you. It's never really, you're never really sure which of the two it is. And both, of course, have, uh, have implications as to how you should, you should deal with it. So, um, one of, the late, uh, his, one of the historians of late medieval Europe, Frederick Gibbs, wrote that without doubt, physicians' deliberate association between plague and poison reflected the similarities between the two cases. So the fear of, play, of poisons and the symptoms of, of bubonic plague were the same. He says, both acted quickly, often producing violent internal and external symptoms, and both were often fatal in their outcomes. So poison, becomes the proximal cause of disease, one of the most immediate and primary explanations. And the Jews, as I said, were, were, were quickly accused of poisoning the wells, but not everybody believed that. Um, for example, one of the chroniclers called Conrad of Megenberg discusses that um, it can't be that the Jews are um, are responsible for the plague because, you know, and it can't be that plague is there to punish sinners because he writes, there are lots of wicked people out there who are not getting punished. Particularly, he says, the rich. And we all know that the rich are usually wicked and they don't seem to be being punished for this more than anybody else. And he also disagrees with the accusation against the Jews because he knew many Jews who were also killed by the plague. By the way, just by show of hands, how many of you have heard the legend that the reason for the anti-Semitic pogroms during the Black Death was that the Jews were dying in fewer number because of halachic, uh, of, of, that they kept halacha. How many of you by show of hands have, have seen that? Yeah. Now, I also grew up think, knowing that. I can't tell you where it came from. Uh, I spend a chapter in my book going deeply into that, and I'm sad to say that there is not a shred of evidence to support that. Uh, and it's a, it's a legend, it's a myth, it's a wonderful myth, but it is a myth. Um, and here is one of the, the proofs that I bring in the book 
where you have an eyewitness account saying, well, the Jews are dying in just as great number as everybody else. In fact, the first recounting that the Jews were dying in lesser number is about 150 years after the outbreak of, of the plague. So it's, it's slightly off topic, but, but, I, but you get the point. So um, another physician, uh, an, another person agreed with, with, with this assessment, and this was the physician, Guy de Choliac, who I said, remember, was the owner of a Latin copy of On Poisons and was the personal physician to Pope Clement VI. Now, Pope Clement VI became Pope in 1342. He, he had a difficult time of it, and um, he, he needed lots of advisors, uh, including this man, Guy de Choliac, who was the Pope's surgeon physician. And when bubonic plague broke out in 1346, Guy de Choliac said that the Pope should spend the, the period of the outbreak living between two large fires because it would it would, it would do away with all the rotten fumes that were coming up from the ground and were thought to be the cause of it. And actually, uh, po the Pope, Pope Clement, spent several years inside his chambers being protected by large flames, and his treatment seems to have been a success. The Pope lived, never contracted it, and, um, and this Pope went on to write that he rejected the notion that plague was caused by a result of sin. The Pope said that plague is not caused by a result of sin, and he said in 1348, about two years after the outbreak of, of, of the first wave of, of bubonic plague, the Pope issued a decree which was called by the generic title Sicut Judaeus, as the Jews. Now, if you just um, were in the exhibition next door, there is a decree to burn the Talmud, uh, and a fascinating and sad story that goes with that. Uh, popes often came out with decrees. This one is a decree from uh, Clement VI, who writes the following. He says, um, even though he criticized the Jews for their rejection of Jesus, he says they should be granted economic freedom and they should be granted physical safety. And he writes, it cannot be true that the Jews, by such a heinous crime, are the cause or occasion of the plague. Why? Because in many parts of the world, the same plague by the hidden judgment of God has afflicted and afflicts the Jews themselves and many other races who have never lived alongside them. Again, I witnessed testimony that the Jews were dying at just as great rate as everybody else, this one from the Pope. But, but what we understand here is, and he, go, you know, he, he goes on, he says, the pestilence is all but universal everywhere, and by a mysterious decree of God has afflicted and continues to afflict both Jews and many other nations throughout the diverse regions of the earth to whom a common existence with Jews is unknown. In other words, the Pope points out there are people dying of bubonic plague in areas where there are no Jews. So how can the accusation of Jews poisoning the wells be, be plausible? And he, he, and he concludes that... Um, uh, the, uh, the charge against the Jews uh, that they have provided the cause or occasion for such a crime of poisoning is without plausibility. Now we know, if you, if you recall, that Guy de Choliac, his physician, was the owner of the Latin translation of Rambam's on poisons. And we also know that the Rambam has written in this book that it is an undisputed fact that you cannot poison drinking water without leaving some mark. You can't drink water innocently and then get poisoned from it. So the rum, the, 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 the Rambam writes this, Guy de Choliac uh, himself owns a copy of this, and by the way, there were three, at least three Latin copies that were presented to popes of the Rambam's work. So the Pope, if he read these things, would also have known of this statement of the Rambam. So, just to cap it all up and bring it, to bring it together, the Rambam writes his book on poisons at the request of the uh, advisor to, to Saladin. It contains all this information about curing bites from dogs and snakes and scorpions. It contains information about curing deliberate poisoning in the drinking water and, uh, and curing deliberate poisons, excuse me. And he also makes it clear that it is absolutely impossible to poison the drinking water 
without, without that poison being easily detected in the water. The book was widely copied, as we've said, and later translated into Hebrew and Latin. One of those Latin copies is owned by Guy de Choliac, who serves Pope Clement VI, and both Clement VI and Guy de Choliac write that the Jews could not possibly be behind the, accusi uh, be behind the, the deaths. Now, we all know, sadly, that the statements that Clement VI made and Guy de Choliac made in his writing that the Jews were not to blame did very little to stem the pogroms against the Jewish communities, which were affected by, by the most remarkable uh, numbers of deaths. It's impossible really to get our head around these, but, but they were decimated, worse than decimated. Um, but I like to imagine that perhaps somewhere in medieval Europe, somebody had read the Pope's uh, proclamation in which he said the Jews can't be behind this. And the Pope said this because he was advised by a physician who read Rambam's book, where it says that you can't possibly be poisoned by water without knowing this. This is, uh, this is my suggestion for this evening. I'm trying it out on you to see what you think. Um, it requires more work, uh, but I think at least it's a plausible uh, hypothesis to test. Um, and as we know, the Rambam is uh, rightly plays for many legacies, um, but one of the least well-known of these is, is this book on poisons, uh, which may have influenced a papal physician and the Pope he served to try and end the anti-Jewish pogroms and the Black Death. Thank you very much. everybody. I'm just looking for the, uh, ah, here we go. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, a tremendous pleasure to be here, part of this amazing program. Thank you to the museum. Thank you to the uh, Rabbi Sachs uh, Harrington uh, uh, Center for, uh, for coordinating this evening. It's really a, a tremendous pleasure to be here and to join you. Um, I'm going to test out Jeremy's uh, theory now, and I'm going to have a, some water. <laughs> and I'm just going to smell it and see if it actually has poison or not. I hope we're okay, hope we're okay. Uh, Jeremy, that was absolutely fascinating. It's also a particular pleasure for me to speak on the same podium with Jeremy. Jeremy and I go back quite a long way. And, uh, and I was uh, thinking, I don't think we've ever shared the podium together, despite the fact that we mix in very similar circles and have uh, many shared interests. So, uh, so it's a real honor and to, uh, to be here. Uh, and in case you didn't get the illusions, Jeremy and Erica actually are married. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do this evening is to uh, do a thought experiment um, if the Rambam were alive today, uh, how, uh, how he would think about contemporary medical ethics. Um, and actually, just a question before we begin, and, and I hope you'll indulge me, it seems a little ridiculous, but you'll uh, hopefully see the point in a bit. Who is this a picture of? <laughs> now, we are sitting in an exhibit of the Rambam. You've seen this picture all over the place. You're seeing this picture on my front slides. So of course, you're gonna tell me that this is a picture of the Rambam. Uh, but in fact, it is highly unlikely that this is actually a picture of the Rambam. The very first time this, this picture ever surfaced uh, was in the 1700s uh, from a work by, by Ugolinus. Uh, and in fact, we really have no clue what the Rambam actually looked like. Uh, we actually do know, however, uh, what his handwriting looks like. And for those of you who have seen the exhibit before, either before this evening or right before this lecture, who had, uh, had the pleasure of listening to Ilana give an excellent uh, tour, which I had the pleasure of joining, uh, you will know that we have the Rambam's actual 
actual handwriting. Where do we have that handwriting from? We have that handwriting from the Cairo Geniza. Cairo Geniza, for those of you who are not familiar, is a repository of manuscripts kept in the Ben Ezra Synagogue in Egypt, uh, spanning roughly a thousand years from 800 to 1800. Um, and uh, the Rambam is just one of many great scholars throughout the centuries whose writings we have from there. Uh, here you have the Ben Ezra Synagogue. Here you have uh, Solomon Schechter sitting in Cambridge um, on the right side, actually pouring through some of these uh, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of fragments. Uh, just to show you how far we've come in the world of technology, uh, it is, uh, there is a project called the Friedberg Geniza, Geniza Project, which is attempting to digitize all the extant uh, manuscripts from the Geniza, some 250, 300,000 fragments that are now held across the entire globe. Uh, and to make them available for all of us uh, in the comforts of our home on our desktop computers. And if you go to Friedberg and Isa Project, you, you will be able to see, amongst other things, the Rambam's handwriting, uh, Yehuda Halevi's uh, handwriting, uh, works of, uh, of Reb Sadia Gaon, and many other, uh, Ibn Gabirol, and other amazing works without having to go to any museum in the comfort of your own home. Now, the Rambam was a physician, uh, clearly. The question is, how did the Rambam train? Did the Rambam go to medical school, for example? Uh, so the short answer to that is no, because he trained to be a physician in Egypt. There were no medical schools in Egypt at that time. Uh, and it is more likely than not that the Rambam, as well as most other physicians during this time period, trained by apprenticeship. Now, while we do not have any record specifically of the Rambam's training and apprenticeship, we do have this fragment from the Cairo Geniza, which seems to allude to the concept of apprenticeship. And it's a letter by Mayor Ibn al-Khamadani to Maimonides himself, um, asking him to accept his son as his assistant in the study of medicine. So he wanted to shadow, he wanted his son to shadow the Rambam in his medical practice. Now, Jeremy and I are both emergency medicine physicians, and uh, we very often get calls from uh, college students, medical students that wanna come join us in the emergency room and, uh, and shadow us and to learn the practice of medicine. Imagine shadowing the Rambam in his practice of medicine, how extraordinary that would have been. Uh, and and Al-Khamadani actually points out that uh, he understands that the Rambam's nephew had spent time shadowing the Rambam, and he's since moved on. Uh, and he promises that he will pay more than his nephew did for the, uh, for the services of mentoring. The problem is we don't actually have the response of the Rambam, uh, whether he in fact took on this student or did not. Uh, the famous letter which uh, has been alluded to, and I'm not sure if this actual fragment, this part of the letter is, is not uh, in, in the exhibit, but there are other, other letters to Shmuel, uh, Shmuel Ibn Tibon in the exhibit in the very first hall in the entry. Uh, but this, this letter is a very famous letter about the Rambam's day. So the Rambam, we know, wrote many works. The Mora Nevuchim is one of them. The Mora Nevuchim is a very complex philosophical work um, written in Arabic. Uh, Shmuel Ibn Tibon, the famous Tibon translating family, wanted to translate it into Hebrew. Now, translating anything from Arabic into Hebrew is not simple, um, but translating a philosophical work uh, is exceedingly complex. So he suggested, I'm gonna bring my work to you and we can, uh, we can discuss this on a phrase by phrase, paragraph by paragraph basis so you can confirm the veracity of my translation. So the Rambam, in response to that, wrote what is now a very famous letter detailing his usual day. And he writes to Ibn Tibon, it's a wonderful idea and concept, but in practice, I have absolutely no time to spend with you. And why is this important for our context? Because this letter discusses the Rambam's medical practice primarily. And it says that uh, he, uh, I'll synopsize the letter for you. Uh, he, uh, he gets up way before the crack of dawn, uh, goes to the palace of Saladin where he takes care of him and his, uh, and his retinue. Um, and then he returns in the late afternoon. And by the time he returns, and he writes so beautifully, says, Vani mes ra'av, and I'm dying of hunger, of emsa haksadros kulam maleos bnei adam goyim ve'yehudim, 
and he sees the, uh, the entire expanse where he returns is filled with people, you know, today we would say blocks or miles long waiting for consultation for the Rambam. Uh, and, and he writes uh, that all forms of people, Jew, non-Jew, pauper, uh, wealthy, uh, politician, theologian, the entire gamut of society, uh, Rambam is the great equalizer. They all stand and wait for the Rambam's, uh, Rambam's medical expertise. He reports that he barely has time to eat. He's lying on his side, maybe taking a little food here and there, completes his consultations, who knows when, into the late uh, the wee hours of the evening, and then and only then, he begins to write some of the works that he, uh, that he, uh, uh, he wrote and that we are now privy to uh, and we spend months and years analyzing. Uh, that was the famous day of the Rambam and the uh, little glimpse into the medical practice of the Rambam. But what did the Rambam study? What medical works did the Rambam study in order to become such an expert physician? So he studied, uh, as we get a glimpse into that from a few interesting sources. In the Cairo Geniza, there are many fragments that aren't exactly Jewish, but are written in the Hebrew language. Some of them are written in the Hebrew language, rather Hebrew characters. Everything that was written in Hebrew characters was deposited, was considered kadosh, was considered holy, and put into the uh, into the repository uh, in the uh, in the Cairo Geniza. Some of it was written in Hebrew. Some of it was written in Judeo Arabic, which is the Arabic language, but Hebrew characters. And someone has actually gone through these fragments and identified the medical fragments. And there's a work uh, called Medical and Paramedical Manuscripts in the Cambridge Geniza Collections. And if you look in the index or the, uh, of this work, you'll see a couple of figures which you might recognize from the history of medicine. Now keep in mind, this spanned from 800 to 1800, roughly. So some of the characters you'll see, and you'll see there's, there's dozens if not hundreds of manuscripts of Galen. Uh, Galen lived in the uh, second century of the Common Era. He was a contemporary in the Jewish context of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. And uh, another name you might recognize, um, Hippocrates. You have the works of Hippocrates uh, were in the Cairo Geniza, hundreds of works of Hippocrates. Now, why were they in the Cairo Geniza? The reason is the Jewish physicians were studying Galen and were studying Hippocrates. And while we don't have the actual books of the library of the Rambam, we actually have the library um, of some contemporaries of the Rambam. Here we have an article about uh, the library of uh, someone who lived literally at the same time of the Rambam. And to give you an idea of what medicine was like, there's an entire book. Uh, this is, this is Judeo-Arabic, Al-Molidin Lechet Ashkar, Hanoladim Lechet Chodoshim, a child who is born in the eighth month. So this, this physician, who is contemporary with the Rambam, has a book on the, was called The Eight-Month Child. Is anyone here familiar with The Eight-Month Child? Familiar with the concept in rabbinic literature of an eight-month child? So I'll share with you. And this is mentioned by the Rambam himself, who was also familiar with this idea. Misha nolad bechodesh hashmini. So I'll just synopsize, just want to share with you that the Rambam in his halachic works mentions this notion of the, uh, the eight-month baby. There was a notion which spans from antiquity until the pre-modern era that a baby born after seven months gestation was completely formed and viable, a baby born after nine months gestation, completely viable, a baby born after eight months gestation was not viable, would never survive. And that, that notion, which, which persisted for many centuries and is also mentioned specifically by the Rambam because that was the context of medicine that the Rambam lived in at that time, uh, infiltrated the rabbinic literature to such an extent where the rabbis said if a child is born after eight months gestation, that child has a very poor prognosis, and if it's a question of violating the Sabbath to save the life of that child, you are prohibited to violate the Sabbath to save the life of an eight-month baby. 
seventh month baby yes, nine month baby yes, eight month baby no, because that baby's not gonna survive anyway. So you see the Rambam, while he was forward thinking in many areas, in other areas he was a product of the world that he lived in and a product of the environment that he, uh, that he lived in. Moving forward, the Rambam actually had many, a tremendous impact on the world of, of, of medicine for many centuries. So basically imagine yourself as a Jewish student in the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, who is your role model? We focus on the concept of role models today, of mentors today. Who was the role model of almost every single Jewish doctor all across the centuries? Rambam. Every single Jewish doctor has always known the Rambam, has always mentioned the Rambam. And here it's stated explicitly. This is Aaron Solomon Gumpertz, graduated in the University of Frankfurt in 1751. Uh, and he writes, you know, he's looking for different professions, uh, um, just and clear path for one who wishes to glorify God. Uh, and he chose medicine. I did not find that the profession of medicine that we have learned through tradition is practiced by great scholars like the Rambam. Uh, what's interesting, and then not for our discussion this evening, there, there are other greats who studied medicine as well. The Ramban, a rough contemporary of Maimonides, was also a physician, and not everybody is aware of that or realizes that. Now I'm just gonna go through a few uh, students who cited the Rambam in their dissertations, uh, and, uh, and those who also mentioned the Rambam. So this is actually a tshuva before I get to the dissertations. This is a tshuva written uh, by Rav Yaakov Emden, a very famous rabbinic figure in the 1700s. And the question was presented to him by a young medical student who was in his first or second year at the University of Göttingen in Germany. Um, and he asked him if he could perform anatomical dissection of a dog on Shabbos. This was the question that he asked Rav Yaakov Emden. On, uh, in ref roughly the mid 1700s. And in the context, Rav Yaakov Emden spoke to him about medicine in general for a Jew, whether it's a good profession or not a good profession. Uh, and, and he writes, uh, So learning philosophy, he said, is not such a good idea, but learning the sciences, learning medicine, is a great idea because this is clearly permitted knowledge. Like we know, some great scholars in the previous centuries, and who does, who does he mention? Of course, he mentions the Rambam. The Rambam is, is, is his role model and his precedent for the permissibility of studying, uh, of studying medicine. Parenthetically, the student who wrote that question, Benjamin Wolf Ginsberger, went on to graduate, and this is a copy of his dissertation in 1743, what topic did he choose? He chose to write on biblical and Talmudic medicine. That was his dissertation topic as the first Jew ever to attend the University of Göttingen in Germany. 1743 is the, uh, is the date of his dissertation. And other students, 1742, University of Halle, mentions Maimonides, not only his medical works, but also his Marinavuchim, also his halachic works. It's interesting you have Maimonides mentioned with fallopius, not with fallopian tubes, with the real fallopius. Fallopius is the person who described fallopian tubes, who is a professor of anatomy in the University of Padua. So he quotes Maimonides and he quotes fallopius together in the same, uh, in the same sentence. You have Isaac Marcus from 1775, a little uh, later than the, the previous student, also mentioning Rabbi Moses Maimonides, uh, Saul Isaac Polanis, 1797, writing in Amsterdam, also mentioning Maimonides. Maimonides, Maimonides Egyptus uh, in Germany, Ignaz Kahn, writing about uh, the mosaic tradition and its impact on medicine for his dissertation. Uh, and moving up into the 20th century, you have um, David Macht. David Macht graduated at Johns Hopkins University in 1905, a fascinating fellow. And for his final senior thesis from the, for graduating medical school, he wrote a paper on Maimonides uh, 700 years after the death of Maimonides in, uh, in, in memoriam for, uh, for that anniversary of the, uh, of the Rambam's death. And for those of you who are in the medical field, you might appreciate some of the names on this page. He presented that thesis 
to some great figures in, uh, in Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. Um, he presented it in the transactions of the Johns Hopkins Historical Club. Um, it present that day were William Welch. William Welch is the founder of Johns Hopkins. If you go to Johns Hopkins today, there's the Welch Library and other Welch buildings. Um, the, the head of the historical club was none other than William Osler. William Osler was the founder of modern medicine. Uh, and you also have here um, Harvey Cushing. Harvey Cushing is the founder of modern neurosurgery. So you had this young student presenting Maimonides and the history of Maimonides to these, these great physicians in the historical club at, uh, at Johns Hopkins. Um, and to give you an idea of, of the evolution of medicine across this time, uh, the Rambam, as, as Jeremy said, wrote a number of works in, uh, in medicine. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not realized by, by, uh, in, this, in this exhibit that, uh, that's presented here. Um, most of the Rambam's works were written in Hebrew or Judeo-Arabic, meaning the Arabic language with Hebrew characters. His medical works were written in pure Arabic not Judeo-Arabic, they're written in pure Arabic. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't until centuries later that they were translated into Hebrew, translated into English. Um, but to give you an idea of the development of medicine from the times of the Rambam, one of the major works the Rambam wrote, wrote was Perush Lepirke Avukrat. Who do you think Avukrat was? Any guesses? Avukrat was Hippocrates. The Rambam lived in the 12th century. Hippocrates lived in the 5th century before the Common Era, 1700 years earlier. The Rambam wrote a commentary on the works of Hippocrates. That's how far medicine advanced. So for 1700 years, people were studying the same text of Hippocrates. Hippocrates, he also wrote a parish on Galen. And Aristotle uh, w informed many of his discussions also. These figures from antiquity persisted for, uh, for many, many centuries. For those interested in the, it, with a serious interest in the medical works of Maimonides, there is an extraordinary scholar by the name of Heret Boss, who is a non-Jewish fellow, but is, uh, is a brilliant uh, linguist and brilliant historian of medicine, who has translated all of the Rambam's medical works from their original Arabic into English with copious academic notes. So if you're interested in that topic, that is, that is the definitive work. Um, how many people here either have bought or given a gift of the Maimonides prayer to any family members? Anybody? So I hope you kept your receipts, all of you, <laughs> because the Rambam, I hate to break it to you, the Rambam did not write the prayer of Maimonides. It's actually falsely attributed to the Rambam. As it was actually written by a, uh, a famous physician uh, in the 18th century whose name was Marcus Hertz. This is actually my copy. I just took a picture of this yesterday, but, but put that in. This is on my wall in my study. My parents, Ali and Mashalom, went to the old olive factory, olive wood factory. You guys remember that? On Rechov Meisharim, down those few stairs, and bought me the uh, bought me that some some years ago. Now. There's a famous, uh, famous, beautiful essay that Rav Soloveitchik, as that's all wrote, Rav Yashavir Soloveitchik wrote many years ago, that he is giving a discussion of the Talmud, he's giving a shear to his class. And, uh, and he begins the discussion of the Talmud, all of a sudden there's a knock on the door, and who should walk in? Uh, none other than Rashi himself comes in the door, sits down at the table, and they engage in a discussion about the text of the Talmud. A few minutes later, there's another knock. Who comes in? None other than the Rambam. The Rambam shows up. The Rambam starts arguing with Rashi. Rashi starts arguing with Rasalovachik, and this discussion gets more animated. Then the last person to walk in is the Rav's grandfather, Reb Chaim, one of the greatest uh, analytic Talmudic minds of the modern era. Uh, and the, the beauty of this essay is to illustrate that there's an ahistorical element to, uh, to the learning of, uh, of, of Talmud, uh, and you bring to bear the wisdom of your ancestors in the analysis of, of the Talmud, even though you add your contemporary analysis as well. So we, so to speak, are gonna bring the Rambam into the room to discuss some topics of contemporary medicine 
and imagine how the Rambam would, uh, would analyze some of these contemporary medical issues. What would the Rambam, for example, think about preventive medicine? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The cartoon says the top doesn't come off, it's preventative medicine. <laughs> what did the Rambam write about preventative medicine? He wrote, and it, it's interesting by the way, in his medical works, there is virtually no halacha. There's no Jewish law in any of his medical works, maybe an occasional brief mention. In his halachic works, you will rarely find medicine, but you do find it. In, in the Hilchos, uh, Hilchos Deos, you actually do find a fair discussion of medicine, uh, and anything the Gemara talks about that's related to medicine, the Rambam will actually comment from the medical perspective, but they're largely separate, uh, and there is no infiltration, uh, so to speak, of, of medicine into, the, uh, into his halachic works. But here he writes, who will the heyus the heyus a goof bari v'shalem midarke Hashem who? Since preserving the body in its ultimate uh, uh, health and completeness um, is in line with the ways of God, shaharei of sharshi yavin o yeda davar mi yedias habori v'hu chole because you can't understand the greatness of God, the wisdom of God, the teachings of God, when you're ill, lefikach tzarich laharchik adam atzmo midvarim ha'ma'abdim nesaguf. Therefore, man has to distance himself from anything which causes harm to the body. And the Rambam goes through this, through this extensively. And when Jeremy spoke, he mentioned one of the, the, uh, the uh, works of the Rambam is actually a, uh, a guide for health preservation and health maintenance. And what's fascinating is that the Rambam actually promises you that if you follow his guidelines, this is what's gonna happen. If you follow my regimen, I promise you that you will not fall ill your entire life. And you will die without the need of a physician. And your body will be whole. But what are the ex exceptions to this rule? And Jeremy will appreciate one of these exceptions that he studied extensively. One exception is, um, if he had, in today's modern parlance, a genetic predisposition to disease. So if something was there before, when he was born, which already was causing harm to the body, I can't promise you that I can preserve your health in that situation. And the second one is im tavo makas dever. If there is a plague, if there is a pandemic, I can't promise you that the standard rules of medicine will, will save you. The standard uh, uh, rules of, of health preservation and preventive medicine will save you. People have actually looked at the dietary descriptions and prescriptions of the Rambam in his medical works and have tried to apply them to this very day. So for example, there's a work called Seated at the Sabbath Table with Rashi and the Rambam. There's a, a diet book called The Life Transforming Diet, Health and Psychological Principles of Maimonides. And there are people who are genuinely searching the volumes of the Rambam to look for the next cure for modern illnesses that perhaps man has, uh, has forgotten about. <coughs> Even with respect to the Rambam's approach to the patient, today there's a more psychosocial approach to the, uh, to the treatment of a patient, the concept of bedside manner. Rambam was way ahead of his time in that perspective as well. Uh, and there's an article written here, printed in the Lancet a number of years ago. The Lancet is the equivalent, uh, the British equivalent of the Journal of the American Medicine Association, or the New England Journal of Medicine. And the title is Moses Maimonides' Contribution to the Biopsychosocial Model in Clinical Medicine. And the conclusion, the medical writings of Maimonides are a rich repository to gain an appreciation of the biopsychosocial foundation of clinical practice, um, even to this very day, so, which is quite extraordinary. What did the Rambam say, or would he say about anatomical dissection? A very big issue, although today dissection is uh, falling by the wayside, and we're now turning to virtual anatomy, more so than actual anatom anatomy. 
But it's interesting to note, and this is an interesting historical observation, despite the fact that the Rambam was an expert physician, he makes no mention whatsoever of anatomical dissection. Why is that? He trained as a doctor. Didn't he, didn't he have to do anatomy lab as part of his medical training? So the short answer is that in fact, anatomical dissection was not an integral part of medical training for many centuries. There was some limited anatomy back in antiquity, but until the period of the Renaissance, even if you trained as a physician, even the universities that sprouted in Europe in the 1200s, 1300s, they did an occasional dissection, but nothing, uh, nothing comprehensive, nothing systematic. So the Rambam actually doesn't comment on anatomical dissection. Uh, it wasn't until this period in this famous author, uh, Andreas Vesalius, um, who practiced in the University of Padua in the, in the 16th century that uh, anatomical dissection became an integral part of, of medical training. Interestingly enough, for another discussion, this university, the University of Padua, was the first university to ever allow Jewish medical students to train officially and formally at the university. Um, we know there were Jewish students in Andreas Vesalius's class. How do we know that? Because we actually have, I apologize, I don't have a copy of it here, we actually have a very interesting manuscript contemporary with Vesalius of the work of Vesalius, but not in its original Latin, nor in Italian, which was the, the language of the, of the uni uh, university, but rather in the Yiddish language. We have a Yiddish Vesalius, which is now housed at the University of Pennsylvania, some 400 pages long. And you can imagine Yossi and Yankel sitting in the back row of Vesalius's class, saying, you know, you know, turning the pages. They, they came from Poland, they came from Germany, they didn't speak Italian, they didn't read Latin, uh, but, they, uh, but they had the, uh, the, the Yiddish translation. For, for, uh, for other reasons not specifically related to this, but for other reasons of medical transmission, we actually find the Hebrew language in the work of Vesalius himself. And this is one example. I, I apologize, it's on the bottom. I don't know if everybody can see it. But the, here, here's the picture, and you have the, the, uh, the description in Latin, in Greek, and in this language, which is Hebrew, and I pulled out that word. Can anybody, uh, anyone who want to hazard a guess what anatomical term that is? The aorta, exactly, haorti. Haorti is the, uh, is the aorta. So let's turn to some contemporary cases where the Rambam, what, what would the Rambam weigh in or how would the Rambam weigh in? So we'll, we'll, uh, this is sort of a, a miscellany of uh, fascinating uh, modern technologies and cases. Uh, and we'll postulate how the Rambam would have uh, adjudicated some of these cases. We'll start with the per uh, perhaps the most complex case. This is one of the landmark cases in the world of Jewish medical ethics transpired in the 1970s uh, when a case of conjoined twins or Siamese twins was born to a, an Orthodox Jewish couple in Lakewood, New Jersey. Um, the, uh, they're called Siamese twins. Anyone know why they're called Siamese twins? because the, uh, the first, the most famous of conjoined twins was, was Chang and Ang Bunker. Uh, they hailed from the country of Siam, hence the name Siamese twins. They were famous because they were exhibited at Barnum and Bailey Circus. They were called Thoracopagus twins. They were joined at the abdomen. Uh, they could have been easily separated later in life, but they refused. Uh, by the way, parenthetically, they were married to separate wives and had separate families. Not exactly sure how that worked out, but that's, that's the fact. Um, but this case uh, was craniopagus twins. Uh, join, uh, I'm sorry, they were, they were um, also thoracopagus, but not joining just at the liver, I apologize, but they joined at the heart. Uh, and they shared one six-chambered heart. And they would never have survived together. And the only theoretical possibility was maybe to sacrifice one of the twins for the possible preservation of the other twin. But to leave them without surgery, they would both surely die. Even performing the surgery, it, it was a, a small chance that they would survive. No surgery like this had ever been done before. The surgeon on the case, for those of you who remember this name, was none other than C. Everett Koop. 
C. Everett Koop, who became the Surgeon General of the United States, was a pediatric uh, surgeon at uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia where this case was presented. What would the Rambam have said about this case? So uh, how do I know what the Rambam would have said about this case? Because when they asked of Moshe Feinstein's Atzal of blessed memory, one of the great Torah sages of that generation, how are we going to adjudicate this case? He invoked Maimonides, in essence telling us how Maimonides would have decided this case. What, what did he decide? So as you can imagine, this is a very complex case, but one of the questions that Moshe Feinstein had, or Moshe Feinstein for, the, for C. Everett Koop was the following. He goes, are these two twins equivalent in their medical nutritional status? Do they have equal claim to the six-chambered heart? Or is one a so-called primary twin and one is a so-called secondary twin? So C. Everett Koop thought about this. He reviewed the anatomy well. He reviewed the physiology well. And if Moshe Feinstein said, everything hinges on the answer to this question. And C. Everett Koop responded, indeed, there is one primary twin who is healthier has greater nutritional status, would most likely survive this operation. But there's a smaller twin, really like a parasitic twin, who is really uh, just, just, just pulling from the circulation of the primary twin, probably wouldn't even survive anyway if we, if we did this operation and left him as the only twin left. So with that information in hand, if Moshe Feinstein invoked the, uh, the Rambam, and, he's, and, uh, and the Rambam writes, Avzu mitzvah losa seish lo lachos al nefesh harodef. The Rambam, in his laws of murder, writes that you should not have pity, not take pity on the life of a pursuer, if somebody is pursuing the life of someone else. And he writes, in that context, for the fetus, is considered a rodef of its mother. So this is a case of a woman who's having difficulty during childbirth, and do you sacrifice the fetus to save the life of the mother? So he said the fetus in that case is considered a rodef, a pursuer, and you're allowed to sacrifice the life of the fetus to save the mother. So Moshe Feinstein said in this particular case, even though there are many distinctions and for, for lengthy analysis and conversation, but he paralleled to this case of Siamese twins that in essence this smaller parasitic twin was a rodef, was a pursuer taking the life of this other twin. And if that's the scenario, you're allowed to sacrifice the life of the rodef to save the near daf, to save the one that's pursued. So based on the laws of the Rambam, Rav Moshe Feinstein actually paskened, he adjudicated that it would be permitted to, uh, to sacrifice the life of the uh, of that twin. Uh, in fact, that's what they did. Uh, C. Everett Koop, this is a number of years later, uh, recalled that famous case uh, with Rav Moshe Feinstein at, uh, at Dartmouth University. What about multi-fetal reduction? Today in the advanced world that we have uh, with assisted fertility, not only uh, do we give drugs to induce ovulation and therefore uh, causing women to ovulate more than one, two, three eggs, sometimes five, six, seven, eight eggs, uh, we also have in vitro fertilization when we externally implant fertilized embryos into the womb of a woman. While it's not as common now to implant so many, but in the early days of in vitro fertilization, they implanted as many as they could in the hopes that one or two would take. It turned out in some of those cases, they all took. And you had what's called a multi-gestational pregnancy. Would you be allowed now, now, the womb is only made for a few fetuses at, uh, at you know, three, four, five at most. Once you get up to six, seven, eight, octuplets, you know, remember octomom, for those of you who remember, nanotuplets, which is nine, and then the fetuses are gonna suffer. They're all gonna suffer. They're gonna have physical debility, psychological debility, et cetera, et cetera. So can you do what's called euphemistically in medicine, selective reduction? Can you, can, you, can you abort, selectively abort some of those fetuses? So perhaps the Rambam's notion of rodef could be invoked here, and indeed rabbinic authorities today invoke the notion of rodef. But the question is, who is being rodef whom? So it, it, in a certain sense, it's, it's mutual status of rodef. They're all being rodef each other. 
So if, if they're all being rhodaf each other, then you don't really have a status of rhodaf at all. So the question is, could you selectively reduce or not? Uh, and many rabbinic authorities, by the way, today do allow reduction. Then the question is, which ones do you decide to reduce? And, uh, and how far down do you reduce? Do you reduce to five? Do you reduce to four? Do you reduce to three? Those are, uh, those are, those are the issues. Um, what would the Rambam say about genetics? This is a beautiful uh, illustration here uh, that uh, you know, DNA, uh, a Torah is part of our DNA, as you can see by this illustration, uh, but also as this uh, discussion reflects, uh, DNA and science and medicine is also part of our Torah uh, reciprocally. Would the Rambam recommend carrier testing for genetic diseases to the, prevent the birth of children with Tay-Sachs or other uh, severe genetic diseases? Uh, so uh, there's no question the answer to that is yes. Uh, the Rambam surely would, uh, uh, would advocate for that as part of his preventive medicine. What about plastic surgery? Will the Rambam allow plastic surgery? Today we have extensive plastic surgery and I'll share with you again here how Rav Moshe Feinstein invoked the writings of the Rambam to permit cases of plastic surgery. The case that was presented to him was a woman, this goes back decades, was a woman who, uh, who wanted a, a rhinoplasty, who wanted to have a nose job back in the 70s, maybe even 60s. Now you're not allowed to cause harm to the body. For therapeutic purposes, you're allowed to cause harm. But this isn't specifically medically therapeutic. So how, how could this be justified? There was anesthesia, there's surgery, there's possibility of infection. So he said, based on the Rambam, the Rambam says you're prohibited to cause harm, to cause bodily harm. Chavala is wounding, which is based on the Rambam's Chovel um, Mazik. But unless, or, or, or actually the limitation is that if it's done derech nitzayon, derech nitzayon means like fighting, like in the midst of an altercation. That's when causing harm is permitted. Implication being, if you're causing some bodily harm or, in, or affecting the bodily integrity for a positive purpose, that's not a prohibition. Medicine is a positive purpose. In this case, for this woman who had severe, what we would call today body dysmorphic syndrome, who had, had, had a damaged sense of self, that would, have been, uh, that would have been a justification. That's not in, a, in, a, in the midst of a boxing match which is causing harm, it's for, a positive, uh, it's for a positive purpose. And the same would apply to organ donation, allowing someone to have surgery to help someone else to, with, who needs an organ is also not a negative uh, cause of, uh, of, of wounding, but something which is clearly, uh, clearly very positive. Um, and let me just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll close our, our conversation. Actually, one more and then we'll close. What would, the, today we have assisted suicide, which is uh, 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 legal in places like Oregon and, uh, and other, other states in this country. What would the Rambam say about assisted suicide? Here the cartoon reads, so this is the lawyer, um, with this woman who was accused of murdering her husband and she says, it was assisted suicide, but he was too pig-headed to ask for it. Um, so the Rambam says uh, that if you cause the murder, but it's not directly causing the murder, so for example, if you tie someone up in front of a horse today, if you tie someone up before a railroad uh, and a train comes, he said you would be guilty in the heavenly court but you would not be guilty in a, in, in a Jewish court of law. Um, what would the Rambam say about cloning? So the answer is, I have absolutely no idea. But if we did clone the Rambam, at least we would have an idea what he actually looked like. <laughs> so thank you very much and uh, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Um, I just have a, a few minutes to talk to both Eddie and Jeremy, and uh, please. We'll, uh, we'll pretend that we're in London uh, in about, I think about 1989, where Eddie joined us for Shabbat and uh, began a relationship of many decades. 
Um, you know, both of you emergency physicians and interested in the history of science uh, and, and Jewish medical ethics, and it wasn't any surprise that you found each other. Um, but perhaps you can help our audience understand what made each of you go into medicine, and specifically ER medicine, and then have this side interest that both of you really developed over a period of decades, teaching, writing about it. Um, Eddie. I actually uh, started out uh, in medicine, then I shifted into smicha, and, uh, and I was considering doing only smicha at that time. And this was a time where, where uh, people actually listened to their parents. And my father said to me, he said, Ed, he said, go into medicine first, then you can do anything you want to do. <laughs> and, uh, and I did that, and, uh, but, but I wanted to relate my Torah to my medicine. And what's fascinating, and this is both Jeremy and I can attest to this, uh, throughout all the centuries, there's an intense desire by all physicians uh, to find a Jewish identity to the practice of their medicine too. So you have students across the centuries mentioning Maimonides, speaking about Maimonides with William Osler. Um, I have a whole list of dissertations written by students on Jewish topics for their medical school. I, I mentor students at Einstein on Jewish topics. Uh, it's just part of our DNA that we, uh, we relate our world experience to our Torah, and, uh, and medicine is one of the, the great professions throughout the centuries that Jews have gone into and, and to have uh, continued to thrive for, throughout all these centuries. Thank you. Jeremy. So I grew up in England, if you couldn't tell, and uh, the British system back then is that you had to choose at the age of 16 what exams you were going to do at the age of 18, and those exams would be predicated on whether you wanted to go into law or to medicine or to English or to philosophy. And so at the age of 16, I had to choose the science path if I was going to go to medical school. And uh, I don't think it's a good idea for a 16-year-old to choose their profession, but that's what was... Uh, incumbent on all of us to do, and uh, to be honest, and it's not a great answer, I couldn't think of anything more interesting. Uh, I couldn't think of something, well, you know, it seems like a good idea at the time. It was a good idea, and um, I became interested in emergency medicine really as, a, as an accident. We had moved to Israel, <clears throat> and while uh, I completed a, a year of, of internship in Hadassah, uh, and then started to work at a fledgling clinic called Terem which was then based in Romeima at the old uh, Mug and David Adom uh, headquarters. Uh, and there I uh, worked for a man called David Applebaum, uh, who um, was an emergency physician, and along with a group of other physicians, um, was uh, uh, together had a lifestyle in which they would work, live, in the, live in Israel, but fly to the States and work as an emergency physician a few shifts and come back. And um, that was the plan then. Um, our, our, our life course changed a little bit, but that was the plan then. And uh, I, I became an emergency physician. Uh, I don't practice anymore uh, other than on Shabbos afternoon and at weddings. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, for the last 10 years, I've worked at the National Institutes of Health. But uh, I've maintained this interest and the, the, and the interest in these uh, what we might call paramedical phenomena has only grown over the last over the last few years. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 interesting to me that both of you sort of speculated what would the Rambam say, which is a testament to your to the enduring influence of the Rambam, but also to your sort of commitment that that Jewish identity bringing lots of different selves together. Um, are there specific interests in the history of medicine that you're currently pursuing that might be a little bit different? So I, I've developed a fascination with the, uh, with the University of Padua in Italy, uh, the first university that, uh, that allowed Jews to train there. Uh, I've actually spent years uh, uh, acquiring copies, not originals, copies of uh, diplomas of the Jewish medical graduates from the University of Padua and poems written in their honor. Uh, I think I have uh, about 19 diplomas and over 100 poems from this particular period. And it, it, just, uh, it, it just fascinates me that, that people practicing today have no clue 
of this rich history. So for example, just one nugget, the, uh, the diplomas uh, are spectacular diplomas, they're Renaissance diplomas. Uh, one just went for auction for $65,000. Um, but did, did you buy it, Eddie? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't buy it. But the diploma, the, uh, the headline of the diploma, the invocation of the diploma for your standard medical student was in Christe nomine, in the name of, of Christ, in the name of Yoshka. Uh, but the Jews had accommodations, so their diploma read, uh, you know, in Dei Eterne nomine, in the name of the eternal God. Uh, probably there's one Jewish mother who went to the office and said, you know, <laughs> no way my son's coming home with a diploma like this. But, uh, but it's just one of many, many things. So that's become a real fascination of mine and uh, I've spent time in Padua and, uh, for, uh, for many years. Yeah, wonderful. Jeremy? Um, so I, I just finished a, a, a rather long book on, on the history of plagues and pandemics and how they intersect with the Jewish people. I'm not quite sure what my next project will be. I have to talk about that with my wife at some time <laughs> and see what she has to say. But um, I mean, the, it, it's such a joy to discover these things. Um, Erica will attest that I used to, when I wrote the book, which was remarkably easy to write because these sources just sprung up. And I would very often come up from my study in the basement and say, Erica, you'll never guess what I have just discovered. And it was that excitement, uh, that thrill of learning a part of our history, as, as Eddie is describing, where there's a, there's a rich history of Jews in, in, in this historic setting of Padua, and the way that they proudly, in circumstances that we can't even think about, you think the universities are anti-Semitic today? I mean, my goodness me, uh, go back to Padua, um, you know, Del Medigo, Yosef Del Medigo, who, who, um, who, who you mentioned, uh, who lived in, 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 in Amsterdam, he actually went to Padua because in Germany they were too anti-Semitic for him and he fled to Padua to complete his medical studies. Um, so so the, the, the sources are there, they're so rich, there is so much to, to be proud of in our history, so much to learn, there are so many Jewish heroes that I discovered along the way. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of a rest right now and um, I'll, I think I'll get back at it pretty soon, though. Right. Um, we're closing the Maimonides exhibit uh, here, the Golden Path, which is, is bit, it's really exquisite, and I encourage everyone to see it. Both of you walk through it. Um, interested if there, if there was something there that you were particularly drawn to. I do know that Ari Rockoff, who I'm grateful for helping us organize this evening, I believe his Maimonides School basketball jersey number 11 is in this exhibit, uh, which is, is a fun fact. But anything that you were particularly drawn to? I, I think I share the fascination with, with most everybody here, seeing the handwriting of the Rambam, imagine him with his quill over the, bending over the manuscript and writing and imagine what was going through his mind and what his day was like is just, uh, is just profoundly inspiring. Yeah, I definitely have a favorite. Um, it's a book in the last section. Uh, the first book you come to on the right is called Yeshua Be Yisrael. It's a book of the Rambam's uh, halachot of, of uh, Kiddush HaChodesh, sanctification of the new moon, lots of astronomy in it. Um, and it's the only book in this fantastic exhibition that I also have a copy of. So Bob Hartman's uh, uh, and, and, and my library overlap in one, although my copy, for some whatever reason, is much smaller than Bob's. <laughs> so anyway, I, I bought this because of my interest in, in, in Copernicus and astronomy. And I wrote about Yeshua by Yisrael, this book on um, geocentric astronomy that was written in the 1750s by uh, Jonathan ben Yosef in, in Lithuania. I wrote about this in another book. Uh, a book I wrote about the history of Jewish reception of Copernicus. And as I was writing my, this book that, that I just completed on plagues, I came across the same book. It's one of the few books that actually over, I, I write about in both. Why? Because Yeshua be Yisrael, which is in that exhibition, Yeshua be Yisrael was written as a gift to the Jewish people by the author who made a vow. He was, he was, um, he fled a, a large pandemic, it was probably bubonic plague, 
these came in cycles. He fled a pandemic and he made a vow and he said, if God will spare me from this pandemic, I take a vow to write a book that will restore astronomy to the crown of the Jewish people. He felt that there were not enough good astronomy books out there. And so he wrote this book, which you can see in the exhibition, but he wrote it as a result of surviving a pandemic. It's one of a few books that are, that are out there. There are others that I mentioned, but just that nugget of information to me is, is something that, that we, we, we really are not sort of accustomed to. Surviving a pandemic means that I'm going to write a book on astronomy, and here it is in, 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 in Rumbum's, uh, in, in this wonderful exhibition. So that for me is my personal sort of, the one that I, that I, um, uh, I, I think I appreciate the most. Um, another fun fact, that something I overlap with, with, with Bob, is that we shared the same book binder. I was talking to, to, to Robert Hartman uh, and asking him who bound his books, and he mentioned the name. Uh, of a bookbinder, and I said, oh, I take lessons with him. And um, this is actually true. I, for many years, and he, even recently, I, I take lessons in bookbinding from a bookbinder who lives in Arlington, who used to work at the Library of Congress, and Robert Hartman used him, this bookbinder, to bind a couple of his books here. And I, too, have a couple of books bound by him, which were really bound by me, with him looking over my shoulder, saying, not bad for government work. So, um, so that's another fun fact, that, uh, something that I, I overlap. It's a wonderful exhibition, and I'm so privileged to have been able to see it now twice. Right. Um, with that, I want to thank our friends at the Yeshiva University Museum. I want to thank the Sachs Ehrenstein Center and invite you to join us at other programs uh, coming your way soon. I want to thank both of you for practicing the mitzvah of medicine, for opening our lives to the antiquity of medicine um, and, and helping us appreciate the Rambam. Uh, thank you for your medical careers, your service, and for your wonderful talks this evening. Thanks so much for coming. Good evening, I'm Gabriel Goldstein. I'm the interim director and chief curator at Yeshiva University Museum. Presenting this exhibition has been an incredible journey and success for our museum. And we are delighted that in the, literally the last week, we were able to look at what I call the ultimate, my son, the Jewish doctor, as the Rambam. Um, and to have this gathering, and we we're very privileged to be able to work in partnership with the Sachs Herrenstein Center um, as part of the Yeshiva University family. Um, many of you, I hope, have already seen the exhibition, and as you know, therefore, it's worth seeing again. So we will have a tour led by the exhibition's curator, Dr. David Sklar, which will begin briefly. Um, as you've heard, we're in exactly the last week of the exhibition. The exhibition will close on February 29th to the public. Um, we have a schedule of public tours through then, but we have an extra special one last chance. So on Sunday, March 3rd, we have a special day where the exhibition will be held over one more time for one day. We have a series of tours being presented with a family tour at 11, tours led by Robert Hartman, the collector, at 2.30 and at 4.30, a tour with David Sklar at 3.30, and highlight tours that are earlier in the day. The schedule is available on the museum's website. I encourage all of you to come to the exhibition tour immediately after this program ends in a matter of seconds. Um, and to send your friends, please, to come back in this last week and for this last day. Um, Maimonides truly shapes all of our lives. Um, and most profoundly, I have to say at this moment, um, we have this rare treat to have writings in Maimonides' own hand on display. And literally for about 10 days or two weeks on display, we have two handwritten Geniza fragments in Maimonides' hand, both about Pidyon Shfuim, about redemption of captives. We have a receipt that we recently brought in from the Cambridge Library, from the syndic of the Cambridge Library, that is a receipt of, with Maimonides' name emblazoned on the first line where he paid to free captives who were taken during a siege in Northeast um, Egypt during the Crusades. And we have something that's one of ubiquitous to Jewish life, a letter that Maimonides signed that was a fundraising letter. Maimonides is out there, Rambam is out there trying to raise funds for Pidyon Shvuim, for what he calls the most important mitzvah, the most important commandment, the saving of captives. 
So as we started this day's evening with that moment of silence, we look back at history, look back at how history shapes us, how Rambam is part of our lives, and our prayers continue for the safety of the captives and that they too should have be redeemed, just as Rambam himself would have wished. The exhibition waits you. Please join Dr. Davis Klar for a tour, and please come back in this last week is really not to be missed. Please spread the word. Thank you. Thank you.